Hello, I'm Jay Goffrey. You may know me for this YouTube channel that you watch uh, if you're subscribed. Uh, if not, you probably know me for my other things, such as my list of accomplishments that I will think of. Um, I'll come to mind later. But the point is, you should listen to me because I'm a man of opinion. And for the last two to three months, I haven't said my opinion on most movies that have come out recently because I've been busy. Why have I been busy? Well, you know, college, family stuff, you know, uh, other things to add to my list of accomplishments. I'm a very busy man. But even though I am late to talk about most of these movies, I feel like that, uh, you know, if I want to get back into doing weekly reviews, uh, which usually in general, they're always like a week after the movie comes out, but because there is so much I miss in the last few months, and I do want to get back to things, I shouldn't leave out some movies that I think would be on my best or worst list. Uh, and these are all movies I did watch. There are 16 movies I had seen in the last um, month to two to three. I, again, I forget. I, I don't count. I write. And usually my reviews are like five to ten minutes long. So to speed up on catching up to all the things I miss up to my next review, whatever that will be, I have wrote down all my uh, reviews into summing up into one sentence. Uh, now keep in mind, if I feel like I have more to say, I will, but uh, I'm just going to try my best by speaking on my mind using uh, my one sentence uh, review for each movie I've seen. So here's the first movie of 1 and 16. If you want to hear more of my elaborate thoughts on these movies, uh, you can see the links below for my letterbox or my website where I put my full on reviews for them. I have 16 movies to do, okay? Now the first movie on my list is the Tetris movie. Uh, somewhat downrated by its lesser moments, the movie shines in being entertaining and fascinating about the story behind one of the world's most popular games and an experience that's close to greatness. So yeah, I thought this was an entertaining movie that, you know, could have been, could have been better I guess, but you know, I thought it was great. That's about it. I give Tetris a 7.5 out of 10. Uh, Creed 3, a solid script that is predictable from beginning to end, but a trio of knockout performances and the heart at center make this franchise have its own voice that hopefully takes more chances in the future. I give Creed 3 a 7 out of 10. Rye Lane, a good romantic comedy that, while well, becomes less funny as it goes on, uh, at least for me personally, does have a unique star with two great leads who play characters that feel as real as the romance throughout. I think this is a great movie that has great romance to it. I just think it's not as good as it being a comedy, but that's just me. It has such a unique uh, visual style, such, un uh, such characters that aren't just blank slates for the audience to put themselves in. I don't know. It's something I look forward to in a romantic comedy, but it's definitely not one of my favorite movies of the year. Or I think one of the, I don't know, like when I heard first people say, this is one of the best romantic comedies in years. I didn't feel that, but I still think it's a good movie, and I understand why other people feel that way. I give Rye Lane a 7 out of 10. Easily my favorite film so far this year, Air. Everyone shines from the script to the performances of its all-star cast, with a story of anyone of any age can relate to about never getting too old for greatness. Or, you know, never being, or you're never too... Well, I mean, okay, it's less about for young people, I guess, but uh, the young people can still relate to this story. This movie has many quotable lines, monologues, the people who make legends happen throughout, whether it be the people on screen or the cast behind it. This gives people a movie that triumphs throughout. It's a movie that, I guess, uh, I feel like a lot of movies on my explanations of why I think lesser of it could be predictable. And I wouldn't, I mean, this is based on a true story, but it's just... It's just such a great script. Like, it isn't just, like, something that I could see other people saying, it's okay, or I thought it was good. I love this movie. It, it's something that makes me want to be a filmmaker. I give Air a 9 out of 10. The Super Mario Bros. movie. Well, I must be the last guy in the world to have an opinion on this. I thought it was a fun movie. You know, in fact, I actually really loved it for what it's supposed to be. 
I thought it's a fun movie that's rewatchable and does so much right. It does suffer if you are the Mario fan in the slightest. And saying that, it does have real problems as a movie on its own, like the pacing. I honestly think I'm the one of the few guys who say I like the licensed music as much as the, uh, well, I wouldn't say as much as the uh, score. Like, I think it is one of the best scores of the year. Probably my favorite so far. But, yeah, I, I like it for what it is. I can't pretend it's a masterpiece, and I don't think other people should, but I don't know. I think for everyone who is a Mario fan, this is everything they can want, but it just won't be a movie for everyone, and we shouldn't be angry at people who just say, eh. So, yeah, I give the Super Mario Bros. movie a 6.5 out of 10. Quasi. Oh, now this movie is great to talk about. I hated it. It's forgettable in the worst ways, where the gross out humor that's more gross and funny. Uh, just it's just something where it's like there was this uh, so there was this sex scene that's like I see what they were going for, but they just did I don't know. It's like I don't mind gross out humor, but the way they present it, it's like this isn't funny, this is just disgusting. Like if they did it the other way around, like there's a reveal during this after before they do the sex that if they wanted to do it after that scene, I would have been like, eh, that's awkward, but uh, I mean maybe I would have laughed. It's just like they know ahead of time and then do the sex, so it makes it more gross. I mean it's already gross to watch because of the, the 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 point is it's a gross movie. In fact, actually I can't remember even if it's that gross. It becomes way more gross by the end, which feels out of place. You know, I'm getting off track. But yeah, other than that, the acting is awful. I haven't seen the other movies by these people. I forgot to write down what this comedy troupe is called, and I don't care. The only person I liked from this cast was Adrienne Palicki. Pal Palicki? Is that how you pronounce her name? She was the only one I felt like I liked in the movie, actually. She was the standout. The movie looks cheap, it feels lazy, and a few laughs doesn't mean it's worth the unfunny rest of it. That doesn't even have anything to do with the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Like, the main character just feels like, oh, we needed something for people to watch if they don't care. The main character is Quasi. Quasimodo. You could have the character rewritten, and that would have nothing to do with the Hunchback of Notre Dame, other than the main character's name being, and that he's a Hunchback. Like, ugh, it's just an awful movie for anyone to watch unless they're high. I didn't watch this high. I don't do drugs. Yeah, I hated this movie. It, it's just, it, I really should have given this a lower grade. I give Quasi a 3 out of 10. Okay. Shazam! Fury of the Gods. This is definitely one of the later movies I didn't see in theaters because I just, I just didn't care. I, even in February, I just didn't care. The trailers looked bad and, yeah, I know a lot of people said this was just whatever. I don't know. As someone who liked Thor Love and Thunder and, and by that... I was entertained when I watched it. I don't know, I guess I'm just the kind of guy who I feel like how I feel, how other people feel about Thor, Love and Thunder is how I feel about Shazam Fury of the Gods. Put that on the box. But yeah, it's just the bad kind of superhero movie where it's not fun to watch, the flaws are present throughout what could be good with a lead that's more annoying than charming and other characters that aren't allowed to shine. The movie feels like the kind of movie that where the first plans for a sequel couldn't be done <clears throat> Black Adam. So, this was the best they could do otherwise. Which, sadly, isn't good enough. And honestly, eh, I don't know. Even though I could do a probably a better sequel than this. And I know nothing about Shazam. Other than his character was originally called Captain Marvel. You know. So, it's when, it's like, when it ends with the joke of, What's my... Hey, so what is my superhero name? It's Shazam. It's like... Yeah, it's... Yeah, whatever. So yeah, I give Shazam Fury of the Gods a 4 out of 10. And now, Peter Pan and Wendy. So, for the Little Mermaid remake that's going to come out soon, I mean, I can't pretend like there aren't actually people who are racist and just hate the actress playing Ariel because she's black. And people think that's why people aren't f looking forward to this. I will say, I think I'm one of the few people who will say, We're just sick of Disney live-action remakes! Seriously, though, this came out, this movie is coming out a month before that movie comes out, so I'm sorry if it seems like, you know, that's the whole reason why, but 
come on, I can't be the only one alone saying that's what, why people are looking forward to this. Maybe it's good and will surprise us. I don't know. Until then, here's my thoughts on Peter Pan and Wendy, if you even knew this came out on Disney+. Plus. It's a mediocre at best movie that offers good ideas to the story Peter Pan, but lacks its own identity and just becomes another Peter Pan movie that looks great visually, but other than Drew Law's hook, who like really gives a great performance. And in fact, I forget. I forget he plays me. He's like a good comedian. I was like, oh, I didn't know that. Jim Ga Gaffigan. That's it. Jim Gaffigan. That's how I pretty say, say his name. Where is I? Oh, yeah. It's just the only thing that makes it worth watching, because compared to other Peter Pan movies or on its own as a movie, it's just a mediocre to below average movie. I give Peter Pan and Wendy a 4.5 out of 10. I can't remember if this is the lowest rated movie I've done this year. I hope not. As I like what this the people who made this movie were going for, but my god, it's just... It was so insufferable. It's terrible with only a the movie Clock is what I'm talking about. Clock is a terrible movie with a, a goodly performance, keeping it afloat from you know, being at the bottom of the barrel, with confusing world building, good ideas, or amateur execution. Like, there's scary imagery that on its own I would be, I think, could work. It's just when it does a movie that's this dumb, it just doesn't work. It feels try hard. And and speaking of dumb, it's just the characters are so moronic when it's like, you know, in other horror movies where the characters are dumb, these characters shouldn't feel this dumb, and it makes it so hard to watch. It just, it keeps it hard to get through, making me, the viewer, feel like an idiot for watching it. It's just a dumb movie. Everything it does is dumb. I hated this movie. I was actually one of those things where it's like I knew nothing going in, or at very, I knew the premise, but I didn't watch a trailer or, or reviews. And then I saw reviews, and people were like, they really like this movie for its message, and I'm not saying the message is bad, like, I get it, it's, well, I mean, I'm not someone who will shame someone else if they don't want to have children. I'm only 19, so obviously I don't have enough experience in life for, you know, people to talk to me about that, but what I'm just trying to say is, well, it's a good message I can get behind, I'm not going to praise a movie just because it says something that does a terrible job doing it. Now, Champions is exactly what it looks like. Every other sports movie ever made that is okay, since it is funny, sincere, and genuine in its heartfelt moments that offers nothing new, it's just enjoyable in its own right. I mean, yeah, it's predictable, but I actually enjoyed watching it, so that keeps it being a flow for being just any other mediocre movie. It's fun to watch. I don't know if I'll watch it again, but I like watching Champions. I give Champions a 6 out of 10. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret. Now, funny thing when I went to go see this, I'm pretty sure me and my brother Kyle, who's 11, were the only guys in the theater who went to go see this, since I went to see this with my mom, who, like, grew up in the 70s, and this was the book this movie is based on is something she grew up with, and, yeah, it was fun in the theater when, like, I heard a bunch of middle-aged women talk about, oh, yeah, I remember this from the book. Remember when it was like like this when growing up? Uh, but, but, but regardless of that, I think this is a story for anyone of any age, though it's target audience, more so we'll get something out of it. I mean, I'm a 19-year-old guy, but even though there are many things I related to while watching it. There were many things I think to myself, you know what, I mean, it may not be the same thing, but I can understand or relate to many other things about this. It's something that is, well, a coming-age story that remains timeless about what it means to grow up with a fantastic cast led by Abby Ryder Forston. Everyone can watch and have a smile on their face throughout with something for everyone to get into. I really do think this is probably my fourth favorite film of the year so far. My third favorite movie behind John Wick 4 and uh, Air is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. James Gunn's epic conclusion that might not work for everyone, but like many, people can love it for its characters, all getting one last time to shine, some of the best visual effects of the year, and the most heartfelt moments that make it for those who don't like it still can agree it was satisfying to see how it all ends. Like, even the people who I know didn't like it, and I understand why, I think it's just a thing that goes down to opinion of, it, what worked for me may not work for you. I have made things that I think were fine. I think they had to be there for the story to work, even if it's too long for some or too dark in places. I loved it. I think this is just great. It really makes me happy to see what James Gunn's going to do with the DC Universe. And 
yeah, that's all I gotta say. I mean, there's more I could say, but again, short review. I give Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 a 9 out of 10. Legion of Superheroes. So, uh, I think I gave this the same score as Shazam Fury of the Gods. Actually, I know I did. Look, it's a movie that for what is a direct-to-DVD under 80 minute long film that could have been a lot better given what came before. It's as is, lacking any chance to take advantage of the concept. Like, it's not a Legion of Superheroes movies. It's Supergirl and the Legion of Superheroes. And even then, it's not done well. It's watchable and tolerable because it is direct-to-DVD and streaming. Like, I think we forgot the... You know, because not everything's just a Netflix exclusive movie. There is a difference when it was like directed VHS, DVD, or streaming. But despite all of that, it isn't a good movie in the least. I think it's bad. Uh, I don't know if I think this is better or worse than Shazam Fury of the Gods. Actually, now I think about it, I actually would rather we watch this than Shazam too. But uh, overall, I give Legion of Superheroes a 4 out of 10. Crater. Well, now this is a movie that I think is going to be a hidden gem. And by that, a movie that, while it could have been great, a movie that goes from being okay to fantastic in so many moments, ends up with characters to care about, performances that have no right to be as good as it is. Like, Kid Cudi is in this movie for, like, no reason. Like, I mean, uh, not to say, like, oh, what is he doesn't, because he doesn't sing or something. It's like, no, he doesn't have to sing. It's just, like, he's in a role that, like, it could have been anyone and gives way too good of a performance that really no one's going to go, oh, yeah, I remember you from uh, Crater on Disney+. Plus. And, you know, it feels like something if this if this wasn't on Disney+, Plus, I feel like the bar would be higher. Like, I don't know, if this came from A24, I'm like, this should have been way better. So, I don't know. But regardless of all of that, it's a movie that with a conclusion that is perfect. It makes it worth watching. Really, it's just, it has one of the best endings of a movie this year. It's something that's held down by bad visual effects and it did kind of feel like it needs a rewrite to take a movie that could have been great, uh, not just be good. Because it's good, like, I mean, you know, it's like, I don't know, like, I could make a sandwich that's good and it's like, I could have been, I could make a new sandwich that's great, but I'm satisfied with what I have. Aiden, I don't know. Look, all I'm just saying, it's a movie worth watching that takes chances in many places. I don't think most Disney movies would. Granted, this wasn't meant to be a Disney movie. It was going to be something by Fox, then Disney Bot Fox. You know how it goes. But overall, I recommend watching Crayer on Disney+. Plus. If they made more movies like this for theaters, we can have something like On Par With Holes or Stand By Me. Stand by me is a way more than holes, but holes are the, the point is, watch Crater. I give Crater a 7 out of 10. Okay, uh, still, Michael J. Fox movie. The only documentary I think I've seen this year. I like documentaries, but I don't think I'm into it as much as, well, people who watch documentaries all the time. I don't know. One of my favorite movies of the decade so far is the documentary, um, what, what was it called? Ah, Dick Johnson is Dead. Great movie on Netflix, watch it. But anyways, uh, this movie though, it's a great documentary that does what it should be. Give the life of one of the most important figures in Hollywood the spotlight he deserves. I mean, we all know who Michael J. Fox is, but it ha it's a story we listen to and watch in this documentary that anyone can relate to and love to listen and watch alongside it with some of the best editing in the movie this year. Like, for a documentary that does this thing where it has like footage from the sh his shows and movies he's in, spliced with like uh, footage that's clearly just made to like transition to what he's saying to what's actually happening. It just does it in a way that's so seamless that even though obviously this is done with editing, I it never broke my immersion. I think it's it really is some of the best editing this year. It's one of the best editing in a movie this year, let alone a documentary that brings tears to your eyes. I think it's great. I give still a Michael J. Fox movie an 8 out of 10. <gasps> and finally, Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves. Yeah, this is definitely a catch up list. Uh, only flaw is its visual effects. Everything else is that it's A plus game. I mean, well, Maya Sophia Lillis, who I think is a really good actress, who feels kind of weird to have like watched a movie with her as someone who was around my age and now she's an adult just like me. It's kind of weird to think about. Whatever, back on track. I do think she should have had more character development. Her character feels a bit inconsistent with her motivation. But everyone else, it's just, it's just done so perfectly. Where it delivers at being the D&D &D movie fans probably wanted for decades. 
I mean, I'm not the most into D&D, &D, and by that, I never played the game once, never attempted to, and never watched anyone else play it. I do like that show, Legend of Vox Machina. I... It has nothing to do with my review, but I just wanted to mention it, because I really love that show. Uh, I mean, watching the trailers for this movie, I thought it was going to be bad, but when I heard it was good, I finally waited to catch it on Paramount+, Plus, and I do think it's as good as I heard. It's not... You know, something that's going to be groundbreaking or anything. Like, it is a fun blockbuster. Something like, I guess, Taka Maverick, where... I think something like, say, the script for that. Like, I know people will say, oh, it's just watching it. It felt like I was there in the cockpit in the jet. But it's like, I think it is a great script. And this is a really good script. That I don't know if I call it great. Like, despite all that, you don't need knowledge beforehand to watch this movie. I think it stands on its own, thanks to great writing and performances throughout. Characters I care about. Everyone besides Sophia Lewis, like I said, has motivation and something for me to root for. It's funny when it needs to be. It's emotional when it needs to be. The pacing, everything. I, I loved it. I Well, I didn't love it. I really like it. I don't know if it's something I'll stick with me or rewatch that much, but if I had to watch again, I wouldn't mind. I give Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves an 8 out of 10. Well, that was a lot to get through, and thank you for staying with me through all this. Uh, the last few months have been hard, but also great in many other ways. I still had so many opportunities and things I got done so I can move on to bigger and better things. It was certainly hard to get through the worst of it for reasons those closest to me know, but despite all that, I'm glad there is an audience who wants to listen to me and hear what I have to say. So thank you.